this week on the Back Table Podcast. Just to give an example, uh, at uh, Gustave Rossi, so the main operator was uh, Professor Thierry Debert, who was working with us on, uh, on preclinical and clinical trials. So he, he has been using the technology for quite some time, but uh, all of his team is now using the, the, the robot. And one of his um, uh, residents just started to use, to be trained and use the robot, uh, the Apian robot, when he left uh, on uh, vacation. And when he came back, the guy had done eight cases and he was as good as uh, the Professor Debert on using the technology. And <laughs> that was kind of a surprise for him because, you know, he had been using the technology for quite some time. But sure. this, this very simple example showed that the guy after eight cases was as good as, as someone that, that had been, uh, you know, co-developing the product for, for quite some time. So yeah, we really want to, uh, to have this kind of a short learning curve because we know robotics will work if all the IRRs in the department can have their, their hands on the robot and use it on a, on a, on a daily basis. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Backtable Podcast, your source for all things interventional and endovascular. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and on backtable.com. First, a brief message from our sponsor. RadPad was developed by physicians for physicians, clinically proven radiation protection during cine and digital subtraction and geography. Don't bet your career or your health on anything less. Trust RadPad radiation protection shields for all your fluoro guided interventions. See radpad.com for more information and contact info at radpad.com for a free radiation evaluation and a no-brainer radiation protection cap. And don't forget to tell them that you heard about it on the Backtable podcast. Now, back to the episode. All right, welcome back, everybody, to the Backtable Innovation Show. We'll also be releasing this on the Vascular Interventional Show because it's highly relevant to the IR guys out there. Uh, we're going to be talking today with Lucien Blondel. He's a robotics engineer and he's the founder of Quantum Surgical, a newer robotics company that has um, applications for interventional radiology and, and imaging guided procedures. He's also the podcast host of the Less Invasive Podcast. I recommend everybody check that out um, to learn, you know, learn more about the robotics field and uh, where you you have guests on like uh, in, in, mostly engineers or, or just all across the board in the robotics industry? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the guests are both uh, physicians and uh, med tech industry peers. And we talk about all specialties from uh, ear surgery, hip and knees, uh, ENT, uh, spine, and, and uh, uh, anything like general colorectal surgery. So a lot of, lot of stuff to talk about. Yeah, yeah, I saw that you just had that uh, ENT on from Paris, um, and we're talking about uh, cochlear implants. We had the guys from uh, Iota yeah. Motion on recently. Yeah. yeah, I listened to this yeah. uh, to this episode. Very interesting. Yeah, 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 it was good. Um, and so, Lucien, welcome to the show. Thank you. Yeah, and and we're we're practically neighbors, uh, as you know. I'm, I'm in, in our audience. A lot of our audience knows at this point. I'm living in Paris uh, this year with with my wife Gilby and. We've had the pleasure of interviewing a number of European docs and um, and engineers and entrepreneurs, and it's been um, it's just been great to expand the the back table network and 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 meet new people and learn about new things. As we all know, a lot of new innovations come out of Europe uh, before we get to get our hands on them in in the U.S. And this this being one of them. And so uh, today's episode, we're going to talk about quantum how how you founded it. And but just bef before we get to that, like, can you share a bit about your background, Lucien? Yeah, sure. So uh, thank thank you for uh, having me on the on the Back Table podcast, a, a, a podcast I, I've been listening for um, less than a year, but a lot of great episodes in the in the vascular and interventional space. So uh, I, I highly recommend uh, this this podcast. So I'm an engineer by background. I was trained as a, an engineer. I have uh, worked uh, for a bit more than twenty years, uh, mostly in surgical robotics and uh, medical imaging across uh, various specialties. So I started uh, in the early 2000s in uh, orthopedic surgery, uh, mostly knee replacement, a bit of hip replacement. Then uh, we designed a, a, a robot for cranial neurosurgery, then spine surgery. Uh, I worked also in uh, for a mobile robotic system for angiography uh, at the GE Healthcare, and, uh, and now in uh, interventional oncology at uh, Quantum Surgical. So Mostly I worked in a startup environment, uh, but also at uh, big corporates such as uh, Zimmer Biomet and uh, GE Healthcare. So I have this, uh, these two uh, sides of the medtech industry uh, I've, I've worked in. 
And also I took uh, two gap years to uh, first to travel the world right after my uh, engineering degree and yeah. also to travel around Asia. That's a continent I'm, I'm fascinated uh, about uh, in the 2009. That's fantastic. I mean, that's, you hear about that a lot from, you know, European colleagues, these, these gap years and getting, taking the time uh, to do things like that. I feel like we don't do as much of that in the U.S. Um, it's just like, you know, just continue on, push forward. Uh, we don't take these breaks to, to travel and, and get that worldly education that you guys are. I, I, my wife and I joke all the time about Europeans are just so much more worldly. They know about everything. They know about events all, you know, in Asia, in the U.S., I mean, I, I, we joke about how you guys know more about U.S. politics than we do as Americans. Um, so I, I, I just think that that's so neat that you guys are uh, that you, you incorporate that into your education almost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, yeah, U.S. is a is a is a continent in itself, so you don't need much to travel to to explore in various states and stuff like that. Uh, Europe is, is different. It's a lot of small countries compared to yeah. uh, the states in the U.S. and uh, and yet there is this uh, this uh, traveling experience that we have uh, in in Europe, and that that uh, I mean that educates. That that's what you said. That educates and gives a different perspective in life, and also on on a professional level. That also you know uh, gives you something, some perspective for mm -hmm. sure. Yep. Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, there's a lot of opportunity in that as you learn about other cultures, you know, um, I was talking to somebody yesterday, the founder of MediCitter, who is, um, from India, but he trained in the U S and UK and, you know, he saw this opportunity to help out Southeast Asia with all, with all his travels. He saw, he found opportunity in Southeast Asia, um, to basically create something that's similar to like doximity, right? Because he see. Oh, this works in the U.S. The, you know, this region needs something like this, and so I, I feel like you don't stumble upon those opportunities unless you you travel and meet these people. And and it sounds like you've had opportunities to, like you said, work in startups, but also big companies. And I'm sure that's given you a lot of um, perspective in terms of when you decided to go out and start your own uh, robotic company. Can you tell us about like the catalyst or what what sparked that idea to go out on your own? Yeah, you know, it's it's quite uh, quite simple. I mean, I, I the, my first job was in a startup, uh, robotic uh, robotic startup. I I joined uh, Bertrand Naum uh, in uh, two thousand and three. He created a medtech essay on a on a project in a, in orthopedic surgery for a robot, and and since then I, I've I've been working in a, mostly in a startup. So um, uh, when we uh, basically we we sold uh, the company to uh, Zimmer Biomet in uh, twenty sixteen. Uh, we helped them, uh, you know, um, prepare the plan for the next years, uh, but uh, quickly figured out that uh, this was not the right place uh, neither for us or, or for the, the this company. They 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 needed a different mindset and different uh, skill sets also uh, to run this uh, this project forward. And so uh, we just uh, established a, a transition plan for a new management team, and and then we we just said to ourselves, okay, let's just create another. Uh, robotic startup and that was just you know the deal uh, the, the agreement was just okay let's let's create a new startup and we'll figure out what we will do how we will do and when we will do it but just let let's take this first step which is creating a company so we just you know choose first the name and then uh, we, we we started from there so you, you are just saying we so I assume you have co-founders did you so it sounds like you knew each other from from the prior company yeah, exactly. So the four uh, four of us who created uh, co-founded Quantum Surgical, so Bertin Naum, Fernand Badano, Sophie Roca, and myself, we have been working for uh, 10 or 20 years together in the previous experiences. And uh, basically, it was the, the management team, you know, the, the the CEO, general manager, CTO, and, and Sophie, the exec assistant of uh, of the CEO. So we've been, we are a very complementary team in terms of skill sets, in terms of uh, mindsets also. And, uh, and and our experience together uh, with all these uh, different uh, surgical robots, uh, we we know we can we can try at least to introduce robotics into a new market segments. And and so the the challenge was to was to find uh, which market segment was the next one. Yeah. So um, let, let's talk a little bit about that. I do. I wanted to mention that you know, according to your website, Quantum Surgical's mission is to to, to no, democratize minimally invasive cancer treatment through pre-planning, advanced robotic assistance, and tumor ablation confirmation. So it sounds like you guys zeroed in on 
I uh, interventional oncology and tumor and specifically tumor ablation as as well as probably biopsy. What what how did you do your market research? How did you de- determine that that was going to be your focal point? Yeah, it's a good question. So uh, actually, we started with a very broad um, analysis. I, I researched uh, the market. So I've, I've been I've been uh, following a lot of companies in this space for uh, for quite some time. So uh, we've been looking at all the specialties and all the robotics companies to have a really uh, uh, the the broadest possible uh, vision of, uh, of of the market, and we try to find uh, a a similar equation that uh, the, the one that worked with the previous um, uh, experience that was the ROSA robot for cranial neurosurgery and spine surgery. Basically, it's a, where there is a clear unmet need, uh, there is a clinically proven uh, surgical technique, but it's still freehand, it's still a, a very operator dependent in terms of the outcomes, and, and, uh, and that's where uh, you can leverage robotics and pre-planning software and confirmation software to help standardize this kind of technique. So that's what we did previously in the epilepsy surgery. So where you have to implant depth electrode, thin electrode deep into the brain. Mm. That was a technique that was mastered in Europe for a couple of really uh, selected centers, but uh, not really in the US because it was kind of a risky procedure and very yeah. complex, very long, very difficult difficult workflow. So we introduced robotics and, and, and then that's from from there, uh, I think like right now, 60 or 70% of uh, epilepsy center in the US use a robot for this kind of, uh, of, of technique. So we tried to find the same equation and we looked everywhere and we found, we, we discussed with many physicians and, and, you know, we found international oncology and there was this, uh, you know, liver ablation procedure that had great result when, you know, when you do a, a radio frequency or microwave and you place the needle accurately. Uh, then it's a it's a great procedure because you know it's a, it's a less invasive. It's a, it can be a, a done on an outpatient basis, but it's still very challenging because it's a, there is very limited guidance, so it's very uh, dependent on on the operator, and and that's why we we decided that uh, it was the right spot to introduce uh, robotics with the pre planning software. So th- that's a great segue into kind of breaking down. The, the the robot itself it, it's called Ep- epion epion yeah epion it seems like an elegant solution it's simple it's pretty straightforward i invite people to visit the the website and we'll have a link to that where it, there's you guys have a nice little trailer on the robot and how it works but can you break down for example like a liver ablation you know practically how it works so really what were the key pro- what are the key problems that you saw when you did your market research i'm sure you visited Docs watch them do, you know, the 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 procedures with, with just with their hands in usually typically in the CT scan or using ultrasound guidance. What were the problems that you found that you that Epion helped solve? Yeah, I mean there are three or four main problems that everybody uh, uh, shared with us. The first one is uh, really know where is the tumor. So uh, you have to locate the tumor in the images. Sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's not because uh, you can have a uh, a patient with a liver metastasis that has been treated by chemotherapy. And then by the time you uh, do the intervention, the metastasis has disappeared or, or shrunk and, and, and you don't see it in, in the images. So, yeah. Or you have a, a, a HCC, so primary liver cancer, that you can only see when you inject a contrast agent into the, into the, the vessels. So that, that you need to really know what's your target and where it is in, in the anatomy. That's where image fusion uh, with software is, a, is beneficial because you can merge uh, different CT images or pre-op MR where you see the metastasis with intra-op CT images. So know where is the tumor. That's uh, where image fusion uh, is very helpful. Then there is an, an issue about how much will I destroy this tumor with the current uh, ablation equipment I have. So right now, they have all this information in their mental space. You know, they know by experience that, you know, they will do a, like a, a three centimeter um, ablation zone around the, the the needle tip, but they do not visualize that actually on the images. So that's where uh, the pre-planning software helps. It just uh, provides a 3D modeling of the ablation zone depending on the equipment. And you can uh, evaluate your margin because we know that uh, effective margins around the tumor, like five millimeter or ten millimeter, are correlated to local tumor progression. 
So you want to have either, either more than 5 or more than 10 millimeters margin around your tumor to, uh, to be sure that the, the cancer will not come back uh, at, uh, locally. So uh, no worries the tumor, how much I will ablate my, 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 uh, my tumor. Also, how can I insert the, you know, the, the, the needle while everything is moving, the patient is breathing. So that's where robotics, collaborative robotics helps to uh, do any kind of angulation and any kind of needle trajectory to place the needle right into the tumor to optimize, you know, the, the, the ablation uh, treatment. And the last one is once you've done that, uh, maybe freehand, then you need to know whether or not you've completed uh, the procedure. So you need to confirm the effectiveness of the treatment. And this is right now done by looking side by side at the pre-ablation and post-ablation CT images and just, again, in a mental space, try to solve this 3D complex geometrical uh, problem and say, okay, I've done enough or maybe not in not that much. Maybe there is a, a small portion uh, in the anterior part of the tumor that is not uh, enough covered by ablation. And this is where ablation confirmation software helps. You know, you merge the two images, you have the contour of the tumor, you have the contour of the ablation zone and gives you the margin. It tells you, okay, you have 2.5 millimeter margin and that's here. Here you don't have your 5 millimeter margin. And then it's up to the physician to say, okay, I could do uh, another ablation session or maybe this, where it's located, I don't want to take the risk of, you know, damaging surrounding tissues and I will leave it like that and, and we'll see what's the outcome on the on the follow-up images. So those three phases help with the most pain points, you know, defining where the tumor is, implanting the needle at the right place and confirming the treatment uh, in the images. Yeah, so, it's, I mean, I think a lot of people, including myself, when they think of robotics or just thinking about the robot arm, it basically putting the needle where it needs to go and, and performing the procedure uh, in a way that, you know, we, we would manually... Um, but you forget about the the large software component. I mean, it sounds like the software is most of the advantage here, right? In terms yeah. of ablation confirmation, confirmation of the positioning of the tumor. Like you said, a lot of times we can't see it without contrast. And then, all, you know, so to confirm you're in the right spot. And then also just confirming that you got a, got a good ablation zone. And we do see ablation confirmation software with other, you know, with, with even the ablation companies themselves, like New yep. Wave, for example, right? But this is this is more built into... The robotics hardware itself. Let's break it down. So I think uh, the ablation confirmation you, you've you've stated like you know clearly, and 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 I think most of us can wrap our heads around that. The it's the manual piece that sometimes I get hung up on is like how do you deal with a robotic arm that's fixed uh, with a needle in place with a moving patient? Yeah, I mean that's a good question. So that that, that two things uh, about that. That's uh, first. The robotic part, and you said it, the robotic part is is, is a, a small portion of the whole procedure. So we designed an end-to-end -end platform to cover all the yeah. issues before, during, and after that. And we, we've we seen that there are solutions for ablation confirmation, but they are specific to one equipment. There are solutions for planning, but they are specific to one center or, or one vendor. There are some robots, but they do not do the planning or they do not do the ablation. We provide... Right. We, we decided to provide the only robot that provides everything for the same procedure. And how does it work for the robot? Basically, it's a very short period of time to insert the needle. So we have a, what we call a respiratory monitoring module that enables the physician to uh, do the needle insertion at the same phase of the respiratory cycle that the one that was used for acquiring the CT scan. So the planning images are done like in end expiration and then you insert the needle at the same phase of the, the respiratory cycle so that all organs are back to the same place. So this is one aspect of the technology that helps with that. And then the robot positions a needle guide, but still it's the physician. So it controls the angulation, it controls the depths and the physician inserts the needle through the guide down to the target. It takes maybe a couple of seconds, maybe 10 seconds, and then you're done. You just release the needle and move the robotic arm away. So there is not, I mean, there is this uh, misconception in some way that the robot is fixed and will hold the needle while the, the patient is breathing, but actually not. It's a very short period of time. It's a one, one insertion to target and, and then you release the, the, the needle from the, from the robot. Is the software and the and the robot helping you find the the safest or best angle 
uh, into the lesion. You know, for example, if you have a lesion that's in the dome, you got to angle up that sort of thing. Is it helping you find that angle? And then yeah, yeah, yeah that yeah, that's a good point. It's right now uh, the what the what the robot enables is to do any kind of angulation, even steep angulation, ascending yeah. trajectories for the liver dome. Those kind of challenging cases that manually would would have been very uh, challenging. For the robot, it doesn't. The robot doesn't matter, you know, if it's uh, anterior posterior or if it's lateral approach. It, it just position a needle guide in space according to uh-huh. the to the plan, and that's where there is a, a lot of benefit. It's uh, it enables the physician to choose the optimal path for this patient for this lesion, and sure. and and not depending on how much he's capable of doing this this angulation, because the robot will be able to place the needle guide on this trajectory and he will just have to push the needle through. So that's where it helps to fine tune uh, 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 the, the approach, the trajectory angle uh, for this for this patient. And yeah. I do believe that the technique will also evolve with, with robotics because you can do more. And so maybe there will um, be some changes in how you uh, you approach some, some, some of the most challenging cases. Yeah, I mean, it might not even be ablation. We have we run into yep. this problem sometimes with just biopsies, especially in the liver, where it just doesn't. You can't. You can see it on MR, um, but you can't see it on CT without contrast. And you know, you might be able to give contrast and and barely be able to see it, and then it disappears. And so, I imagine it it would be helpful with, in the cases of biopsies as well. And, and anybody that's doing a lot of ablations is clearly going to be doing a lot of biopsies probably in an IO department or any any IR department. Um, are you seeing it being used for both or is it more for ablation? So right now we're focused, I mean, we, we were very laser focused in our uh, product development. So we targeted first the liver ablation and we tried to provide the most value for this procedure. That's why we have a software that does it all. And, yeah. and then we extend it to uh, the abdomen, so for kidney ablation also, and also to other, so the technology can guide any kind of needle. It can be a biopsy, it can be fetish replacement, it can be drainage, any kind of needle that uh, that you need to plan in the images and insert into the anatomy. Yeah. Uh, the technology could be used for that. And we've seen uh, right now uh, the clinical experience is mostly on ablation because that's where it provides a lot of benefit right now. But also they've been uh, using, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I remember one case where he was, that was a challenging case because the tumor was close to the colon and to the gallbladder. And so the so the interventional radiologist has to do a hydro dissection and balloon placement. Mm-hmm. And so he used the APN robot also for that. I mean, to place the needle uh, in, in, in between the two organs, there was just a, a one or two millimeter space that was very challenging for him to place the needle there. And he used the technology uh, to place the the needle uh, in there and and to separate the two organs uh, by uh, injecting water and 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 uh, doing the the ballooning so that uh, the ablation would not damage the surrounding uh, tissue. Okay, and then so what what types of ablation is it compatible with? Is it anything you mentioned RF microwave before? But it could it be cryo. I mean, sometimes you have you it involves multiple probe placements. Can you walk us through that? Yeah, sure. So our platform is hardware agnostic. So any kind of CT imaging, any kind of MR imaging pre-op, and also any kind of ablation modality. So it can be radio frequency, microwave, cryo ablation, or IRE. And so that's basically how we design the technology is to uh, to be able not to change anything the the IR is already doing right now. So if if he prefers microwave over RFA or if he's doing a lot of cryo for the kidney, he can use the robot as well. And where you, where you mentioned the multi-needle, multi-probe procedure, that's also a, a huge benefit of robotics because these this kind of procedures, when there are geometrical constraints, such as IRE, you have to place the needles parallel to each other. You can right. place five, six, seven, up to seven or eight needles into uh, the, the very large tumors. That's a hugely challenging uh, case when you when you do that free and, and not that many centers are capable of doing that and are trained to do that right on a routine basis and when it for the robot it's it's very easy you just go to the first trajectory you go to the next one and all this uh, challenge in the planning and needle placement is handled by the software so you can choose your pattern there are a lot of different patterns uh, depending on the manufacturer 
and it's all pre-built into the software. So you just choose, okay, I want four probes. I want them to look like that. I want them to be parallel. I want to spade them 15 millimeters. And then you just enter the needle insertion phase and you just do one needle after the other. And that's where you can gain, we hope, a lot of efficiency because instead of spending one hour to place the four needles, you can place the four needle in one minute. So that's that's uh, that could be uh, um, a game changer to uh, uh, to have this kind of more challenging cases or difficult uh, modalities uh, to be widely adopted. Can you tell us just like accessibility where people can get their hands on quantum surgicals Epion? Yeah, so right now the, the device is CE marked and FDA cleared. We installed the system in uh, at two uh, centers in France, so Gustave Roussy uh, Cancer Center in uh, in Vigif near Paris and also in Lyon, University Hospital. So these are, those are two big uh, cancer centers. And uh, we are in discussion with uh, with uh, several centers in the U.S. to start uh, an Epion robotic program also in the U.S. Right now, we're focused in France, uh, but uh, very soon this year, uh, the, the goal is to expand to uh, other uh, countries in Europe and the U.S. to really uh, grow this clinical adoption of the new robotic technology. And I know you were at you were at Circe, uh, and you guys had a booth there where you could demonstrate the robot. Are you planning on um, in, in preparation for this expansion? Are you going to be at any upcoming, like for example, SIR in March, where t- U.S. docs can get their hands on on uh, the robot and just see how it works? Yeah, we'll be at uh, every uh, international oncology congress. So uh, we, we went at uh, Spectrum SIO. Uh, yeah. We will be at SIR Circe. Uh, yeah. and and all, all all the other I mean all the conferences dedicated to inter- interventional oncology we try to be there yeah oh yeah SIO starts tomorrow right are you head, are you flying out or you got a team I bet I'm no, no, sure the, the, the team is over there yeah yeah <laughs> you can't go to all this stuff because I you know I, I'll be at SIR and I, I definitely would like to to go over and check it out because um, I didn't get to see you guys at at Cersei. I do want to know a little bit more about the learning curve. Sometimes with the new technologies, the theoretically it it saves time, but then you know your your tech can't learn it, um, or you can't learn it because you don't have time. What's the what's the learning curve look like, and um, how have you seen that kind of improve or evolve over time? So uh, actually, the learning curve is very very short, and that's something that we kept in mind since the beginning because we know from experience to introducing robotics in orthopedics, neurosurgery, spine surgery that it's a key uh, factor to success. You want to have users that are ab- able to use your technology very quickly. So, yeah, just to give an example uh, at uh, Gustave Rossi, so. The main operator was uh, Professor Thierry Debert, who was working with us on, a, on preclinical and clinical trials. So he, he has been using the technology for quite some time, but uh, all of his team is now using the, the, the robot. And one of his um, uh, residents just started to use, to be trained and use the robot, uh, the Apian robot, when he left uh, on a vacation. And when he came back, the guy had done eight cases and he was as good as uh, the Professor Debert on using the technology. And <laughs> that was kind of a surprise for him because, you know, he was, uh, he had been using the technology for quite some time. So he, he could not figure out how much the learning curve was. But sure. this, this very simple example showed that the guy after eight cases was as good as, as, as someone that, that had been, uh, you know, co-developing the product for, for quite some time. So yeah, we really want to, uh, to have this kind of a short learning curve because we know robotics will work if, uh, you know, all the IRs in the department can have their their hands on the robot and use it on a on a on a daily basis. How how has it been with? Te- I imagine nurses don't really have to be involved, but what about the technologists? Um, how's it been with them learning and and maintaining that that knowledge? Because you know, as we know, there's turnover with technologists as well, and and that can be kind of frustrating. Yeah, and and actually they play a quite a significant role in the in the use of the technology because uh, I mean and it will depend on the regions and the countries and 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 site preferences. But uh, in some of our centers, the the radiology technologist is actually pre- preparing the, the 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 planning, and so the 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 IR comes and the patient is prepped, the case is planned, and it only has to review, you know, what has been uh, prepped and 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 just start with the with the actual intervention. So 
the radi radiology technologies, they are used, you know, to review the images in uh, multiplanar reconstruction. They are used to manipulate this, this kind of software. So it's kind yeah. of uh, it's kind of easy for them to to get this part of the you know, planning phase, uh, and and then operating the robot is quite simple. It's just you know sending a, sending commands to uh, to move the robot in in one one or the other direction. So it's it, it it's quite quickly. Uh, I mean they are used to uh, work with uh, big irons, you know, complex machines, the CT, the MR. So the the, the robot is not the, the most complex the, uh, machine. Have you guys measured time savings, like on a you know just a stand you know typical liver ablation, liver tumor ablation, um, you know even a straightforward case like one probe or, or two probes? Have you guys looked uh, at that in any any kind of studies or or internally at what kind of time savings you've seen once people are trained up? Not right now. I mean that's not our focus. I mean uh, yeah. I mean we we've done a, a pre market study on feasibility and safety. And really what we want to, we, we are really, uh, you know, we take one step after the other. So uh, we want to make sure that uh, the, the system enables to place the needle where the physician wants and uh, safely right. and in a reproducible manner. And, and then actually, yes, we are collecting data right now on, on the operating time and uh, radiation dose. And we hope, actually, we hope that uh, there will be cases when the time will be reduced, there will be cases where the radiation will be reduced for, for sure. I mean, I mean. We hope yeah. uh, 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 on this because you only do a, a, a scan before and a scan uh, for the needle placement and, and the scan at the end, and you don't don't have to do all those checks in between. Uh, but uh, definitely, I was talking about multi needle procedures, and Professor Debert showed it. Uh, I think uh, in in one of the previous uh, conferences, he was impl implanting uh, four electrodes in one minute, and and so this. Wow. I mean, this is just uh, an example. It's not, uh, you know, clinical evidences, but th this is uh, an example of what could uh, be the benefit in terms of time saving for uh, multi multi probe procedures. For a single yeah. probe, we'll see because right now, you know, it's the, it's the very beginning. It's introducing the uh, robotic technology uh, into uh, into um, a new market segment. So we will not gain time for a very basic single procedure right now. Right. Uh, but uh, that that's that that's not where we uh, we we provide the most value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the key thing, obviously, being uh, consistent and sufficient ablations, right? And like you said, in a safe, deliverable way. I, it would be interesting to to see. Have you guys ever done or or considered doing any sort of you know live case with you know, for example, the guys in Paris, or uh, just to show. Uh, anybody who's interested, how it works, you know, where how how it's being used practically, or even just having inviting people to come watch him do cases. Do you guys have th programs yeah. like that set up? Yeah. So so for the live case, actually, there was one already. It was at uh, um, it's a French conference that was organized by uh, Gustave Rossi. So they did a, a live case, and there was a, a lot of IRs from France uh, watching the case uh, uh, at uh, Gustave Rossi, and and we'll we'll do that more in the, in the future. Yeah, uh, we we will be also releasing a video. I think it's today uh, on uh, social media that uh, it's it's a short, you know, a one or two minute video that uh, shows how the system is used in on an actual patient that was the ninety fifth patient uh, at the Gustave Rossi Cancer Center, and um, and yes, those 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 first uh, users of the Epin system will be uh, pro kind of proctors and will will uh, you know. The people will be able to come to these centers to uh, watch uh, how the, the the robot is used on a, on a daily basis. So that that's those three areas that we are uh, working on uh, uh, in 2023. Yeah, that's fantastic. Because um, I I would love to see that. I'm, I'll keep an eye out on. It. So be sure to tag me if you get if you can or tag Backtable on that video if you guys release okay. it. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk to, as we kind of finish up on the hour here soon. I wanted to to learn more about you know you we hear a lot about uh, you know obviously artificial intelligence and medicine, but also we're hearing more and more about surgical intelligence and the the data collection from procedures. And I imagine that would be that data would be easy to collect given your software, and 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 having that instant feedback as to okay, you know the the Epion's done you know a thousand of these ablations liver ablations. You know, maybe making suggestions on needle placement for the best ablation and getting that instant feedback while you're doing a procedure. Do you are you guys working on that sort of thing, or is that is that already in, in, integrated? 
Yeah, no, so, so yeah, we're working on that right now. We have uh, uh, actually an uh, AI team. I just recruited a head of AI uh, this uh, January. So we have a, a team working Perfect. on co collecting this data and, and having this, making this vision a reality in the, in the next couple of years. So there are a lot of things behind, you know, surgical intelligence. It's basically, you know, machine learning, deep learning, computer vision, augmented reality, all that stuff. In right. surgery, it's a bit different because you have the video feed from the endoscope. So that's basically where you will get all the information about the movement of the surgical instruments, the anatomy, and you will be able to display like uh, blood blood perfusion, uh, uh, critical anatomies in the in the images. So when we look at uh, international oncology, we could we could do similar stuff in the on the images, actual CT and MR images, by automating all that is identifying anatomy uh, tumors ablation zone in the images. So that's where intelligence uh, can uh, help accelerate this, this this process during the planning and ablation confirmation phase. And, and I mean, you're right, uh, AI right now, we know we've seen a, a lot of uh, a new um, models like, you know, chat GPT. It, you just, as long as you have the right data set that is uh, correctly annotated, labeled, and that is representative of the of your practice, then you can train uh, a model on, on the data set and, and, and get the outcomes and the outputs and predict what is the best outcome for, uh, for, for this specific patient. So those are areas uh, we are working on. And we do believe that uh, there is a way, there will be a way to use AI to predict uh, local uh, tumor progression based on the mm. pre-op and intra-op data and give yeah. that information right during the, the procedure so that the, the physician can adjust either do an other uh, ablation session or uh, insert a second needle and 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 the system could you know with it with this intelligence uh make suggestions and at the end it's only i mean it's it's still the physician's decision to to do uh, whatever he wants to do for for his patient amazing i mean it's just it's incredible you know like what we're going to see over the next 5 to 10 years and in, in the in the the changes in, in how we're going to be practicing interventional radiology and interventional oncology I'm really excited for it. Uh, as we finish up, I wanted to ask you if you can kind of, for those of us who don't know a lot about, you know, and, and we were talking about this before we started, is kind of the 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 lay of the land in terms of robotics in intervent in interventional radiology in interventional oncology. Because, as you mentioned, it's been it's been around. Robotics have been around in ortho for a while, uh, neurosurgery for a while. Uh, but it, for interventriology, it's, it's new, right? And and as we hear about this and we see these technologies in the exhibitors halls these, at these conferences, I feel like a lot of people might be a little bit intimidated. And so I was wondering if you could just kind of give us a, a summary of what the landscape looks like, not not beyond quantum surgical, right? We mm -hmm. know we've heard of some other players out there, exact robotics. Um, I think interventional systems is yep. another one. But tell tell us, you know, about what. The compet, you know, maybe whether it's competition or not, what the the landscape looks like for interventional uh, with robotics. Sure. So to just just to start with, I mean, it, it 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 seems new to people, but actually, it started in the late '90s, early 2000s. Uh, teams at Siemens and Philips and Johns Hopkins have been doing a CT guided a robotic device for inserting needle in the abdomen, in the kidney, and and with the first cases as, uh, like 20 years ago. So there were those were not product, but uh, I mean, right. it, it, it has been uh, quite uh, investigated uh, a long time ago. But right now, you, I mean, you're right. There is a surge of uh, robotic offering in uh, in the IO space. So basically, you can categorize the non-invasive solution, the endovascular, endoluminal solution, and the percutaneous solution. So when it comes to non-invasive, you have histosonics that is uh, developing the histotripsy uh, procedure that is yep. purely non-invasive. Uh, yeah. you, you can also count maybe the cyber, cyber knife uh, uh, device from Acura, but uh, that's not really IO. You have then the, all the endovascular uh, system that we basically push, controls, steers, a catheter or a bronchoscope uh, to uh, reach the tumor or to, uh, to, to perform uh, any kind of uh, treatment uh, in, in, the, in the airways or in the vessel. So that's, uh, you know, the Siemens uh, Corpus system and uh, the RoboCat uh, R1 system that are teleoperated uh, system. And uh, on, on the pulmonology side, there is the ION from Intuitive and the Monarch system from uh, Oris that are in the, 
lung biopsy, but also now lung uh, moving on to lung uh, ablation uh, through the airways. And percutaneous system, you have, uh, I think, four, maybe three, five, four, four systems that basically have the same principle of, you know, guiding the needle. You have either uh, our system that provides the, keeps the tactile feedback uh, to the to the physician, so the quantum surgical or the micromate from interventional system or the maxi robot from an engine company, Perfint Healthcare. And you have an automated uh, needle insertion approach provided by Exact that is more targeting the biopsy. It's not really uh, designed for uh, ablation or for multi-needle procedures. It's more for efficiency in the OR, uh, remotely doing biopsies uh, from the console room. So those are the basically the the three areas where you will see a uh, robot evolving. And uh, and the endovascular space is uh, is specific because there are those are teleoperated robots, so they are also moving on to uh, telestenting and, and operating from 50 kilometers away or 200 kilometers away. This is something that uh, is not uh, the, the the target of what we are doing right now in a percutaneous ablation. Great. That was a fantastic summary, Lucien. <laughs> Um, you just rattle off a lot of names. We'll try and get those down and and provide uh, a, you know a list of other companies that you listed just in the show notes so that people can explore those other things. Um, and again, a lot of those companies you'll will probably see at the upcoming Cersei, and um, they might even be at SIO this week. Or sorry, at upcoming SIR. Well, anything else uh, that you want to add that we that we left out, uh, Lucian? No, I mean we we are very excited to uh, to to have uh, many players in this space because I strongly believe it's it's a uh, it's really difficult to introduce robotics in a new market segment. We've been uh, experiencing yeah. that in in other fields right now. You know, it's very common in uh, general surgery, colorectal surgery, orthopedics, and you know, it's just a choice of which robot uh, people want. But uh, this is a new space, and uh, uh, we need to educate the market. We need to educate the physician community about what is robotic, what is planning software, what is navigation, how it can help, what are the limitations, how it should be used, how it impacts the workflow, uh, the OR team setup, stuff like that. So the more people uh, in this space and and, and, and the faster uh, robotic, uh, robotic adoption will be. So I'm, I'm happy to have the, all these uh, uh, colleagues uh, working on this uh, the same goal. Yeah, it's it reminds me of um, you know we've had uh, prior AI founders on like Elad Wallach and and Chris Mancy on the show on the innovation show talking about you know something similar in the in the AI space where you have all these players and there and there was a time where there was maybe too many players and and some of them got kind of weeded out but he said it, it's great to have uh, all these companies because it pushes the field forward mm -hmm. um, you know a little bit of competition is always good. And you're learning from each other, you know. So yeah. one company might be focused on, you know, uh, getting through, getting something through the FDA, which helps the other ones get, you know, get through afterwards. And and you know, the the leaders will rise, right? Uh, and it's all a lot of it's all about persistence. But he he said it's it's always good to have competition, and uh, namely, you just you just learn a lot from each other, and, and everything evolves faster. Yep, exactly. Yeah. So, well, Lucy and, and everybody, be sure. I'm sure you you cover a lot of this stuff on on the Less Invasive podcast. Everybody, be sure to check that out. Available on Apple, Spotify, all the podcast platforms, right? All the, all the platform and on YouTube, and on YouTube. Perfect. Um, well, thanks again, Lucy. I appreciate you coming on the show, um, and we'll we'll catch everybody next time. Bonjour, merci. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson. And Delaney Aguilar. Social media and PR by Ann Dang. Administrative support provided by Jim Lee Kennebrew. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening. 